asked me to come back and talk a little bit about trauma-informed care, especially in relation to what you folks do in crisis. So as we talk about trauma-informed care, I'm going to integrate a lot of trying to talk about self-care as well, especially given what you do in crisis and what we all do here in mental health as being important to take care of yourselves in order to be able to use trauma-informed approaches with your clients. <coughs> so as I go along, I'm going to be proposing a lot of open-ended questions to you. So I'd like to get hopefully some feedback as we go along. And this is meant to just help us think about the services we're providing now, what we're doing really well, what maybe could be more trauma-informed. <clears throat> And this is something that folks are trying to do everywhere across the country in terms of being more trauma-informed, making more changes that are helpful to clients that have experienced trauma. And so it's something that's continuing to grow and kind of the buzzword right now, I guess, is being trauma-informed and kind of what that means. So. My ultimate goal today uh, is that everybody learns a little bit more about yourself and how you are trauma-informed in the work that you do, hopefully already. And hopefully you'll learn at least something new today, something that um, you hadn't thought of or something that you hadn't tried, and that you can possibly share this with the techs, the doctors, the nurses, the PSAs, all those folks that you work with or come in contact with through crisis. Um, recognize when you feel burnt out, because we know what happens to all of us, and then how that impacts our ability to provide trauma-informed services to clients. Um, and seek out opportunities to learn more outside of just what I'm sharing with you today and um, how you can be additionally trauma-informed. Um, I, to give a little background, um, prior to coming to Vermont, I worked in Florida and I worked at a crisis center. And the system down in Florida is very, very different than Vermont. So it was kind of eye-opening when I came up here. And because it was so different, I had asked Mike if I could meet with um, a few of the crisis folks and just get a sense of what you guys do up here, the process for how you assess for crisis, what you look for, some of the challenges working in the hospital, what you see. Because the system I came from in Florida um, was different in many ways. We had um, what's called a Baker Act, which is a 72-hour hold, similar to if somebody writes somebody to come in um, involuntarily to get crisis assessment. And folks could, if they came into crisis, they could be brought in by police. Police were able to write Baker Act, so a police officer could write something that could hold somebody for 72 hours for an assessment. Um, I, as a social worker, could write a Baker Act to hold somebody for 72 hours. And it was very reactionary. So say Mike emailed me and he said that he's in crisis, he can't stand working for Rutland Mental Health anymore, and he wants to go kill himself. Well, I could call the police and say, my friend's in crisis, here's his address. The police would go pick him up and bring him into the crisis center to be assessed. So a lot different than kind of the system is up here, um, in my mind, from I think ours was a lot more reactionary and maybe easier to get in. Here it seems like there's a lot more stringent criteria that you folks are working in in terms of getting somebody into services and, and having to meet very specific criteria. So just wanted to um, keep that in mind. All right. So before we get too far into this, I'd like you to take the index card. And this is nothing that you have to share with anybody. But I'd like you to reflect back on a particular client that you interacted with through your work in crisis, whose behavior challenged you, challenged your patients, 
It could be somebody that is a frequent <coughs> visitor to crisis or somebody that was just um, more difficult than normal in terms of their state when they came into crisis. So either you don't have to write down anything specific about the person. You can write initials if you wanted to or just male, female, relative age, just to something to jog your memory about a particular person that was challenging. And then as we go through, I'd like you to try and keep this person in mind as we're looking at these different trauma-informed approaches and keep this individual in the back of your mind in terms of how did I handle that? What ways did I use maybe some of these skills? What ways could I have done something differently if I'm faced with a similar situation or even the same client again in the future? Everybody have somebody? Might be the same person for all of them. It might be. <laughs> yeah. I'm assuming that can't be too hard to think of somebody in the work that you guys do. Is other staff inclusive? Oh, other staff. Uh, sure. Yeah. We need to use trauma-informed approaches with our, our fellow colleagues. colleagues. Absolutely. So another question, if you guys forgot from earlier when I met with you, it's very interactive. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you're kind of awake this morning. So thinking for a second, what I'd like to just get some of your thoughts. What life experiences of yours contributed to you deciding to come into this field? What made you decide, I want to work in mental health, or I want to work with people that are coming in on the absolute worst day of their life and talk with those people. Nothing? You guys I just are glutton for punishment? <laughs> I guess we're not going to share that, are we? <laughs> I mean, give me the, at least the like stock answer. I like to help people. You've got to give me something. I wanted to get rich, actually. <laughs> to get rich. There you go. Be a multimillionaire in the crisis field. Rich in spirit. Rich in spirit. <laughs> Why else? Why else did folks get into this work? My dad begged me not to be a lawyer. Begged you not to be a lawyer. So this was the fallback? But then when I told him I was getting into this, he begged me to be a lawyer. <laughs> and he changed his and mind. Every psychiatrist he's ever known is crazier than a lawyer. <laughs> but um, for me, actually, um, I just I was I was fascinated with schizophrenia and just the workings of the human mind and human behavior in general. Yep. So when I was trying to figure out what degree I'm going to get in college, human behavior was just kind of a no-brainer for me. Mm -hmm. More of a calling, I think. You guys would not do very good on the first interview here. <laughs> They're shy. You have to ask all these questions of clients, right? You're on the other side. Their answer. Silence. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you get them to talk? <laughs> well, I think I, I think some of it's pretty personal, and we you know I, I don't think that we're going to kind of open up and share. Can you give me the surface level without giving detail? Well, I think we all, I mean, I speak about everybody, we, we come to, at least I came to this because of my life experience, my, the family I grew up in, a lot of, okay. a lot of, you know, well, I, I grew up in a family, an alcoholic family, and that brought me, you know, to, to wanting to know why. <laughs> wanting to sure. Know why. People were acting the way they were acting, you know. And, mm -hmm. and I was fascinated with psycho first psychology course I ever took. I was pretty fascinated, and I was get started to get some answers from that class. Excellent. Yep. Um, about my family, <laughs> which I had not a clue. So, yeah. so a lot of times, for many folks in this field, personal experiences. I know that's very true in the addiction field too. A lot of folks that have come out and are work through their issues and are sober and find that they're 
want to help other people. So it makes a lot of sense. So also we're going to keep that in mind as we go through because it's going to impact kind of our trauma-informed approaches. So what does it mean to be <clears throat> trauma-informed? All right, I'll make, you're going to make me tell you this. <laughs> I'm always asking you guys. It's not rhetorical questions. What do you, what do you guys think is trauma-informed in the work that you do? I assume that everybody I see, well, just about everybody I see has been traumatized. Yep. Um, to some degree, it's just different degrees of trauma. Absolutely. And trauma informed is just kind of trying to enter into their world to me. Like, yep. And it's, it, it's pretty much what you said, being aware that the folks that we come in contact with have experienced trauma, and usually significant trauma. Somebody that has a pretty good life is not likely to come into crisis and have to attempted suicide if their life is going fairly well. So we usually think of somebody that, you know, has experienced some type of abuse, violence, substance issues, family issues, neglect. I mean, the list goes on. So it's being mindful that those that we come in contact with have experienced likely some significant trauma. And then it aims to understand that they're functioning now, sometimes we use the word maladaptive, right, in our terms. So their functioning now is in light of past events and not necessarily needing to be fixed, but these are kind of how they've learned to cope, right? So people that often self-injure and cut if you've ever talked to somebody, what do they say when they cut? I feel better, right? I get this release. It's not a healthy coping skill, but it's a skill that they've had to learn in order to get through some type of pain that they've experienced in their life. So being mindful that these are things that folks are doing to help themselves in some way because they haven't learned a better way. So using all of the, this knowledge and kind of to inform our work and be mindful of these things as we interact with clients. <clears throat> so there's a bit of a difference between trauma-informed and trauma-specific. <clears throat> so trauma-informed is really just basic education on trauma, right? Trauma is kind of the word everybody hears now, traumatized, trauma. Um, so it's a basic education of what that means and basic understanding of its impact. So People with a lot of trauma, substance use, right? Suicide attempts, dysfunctional relationships. Those are impacts of trauma that we see. Um, and informed means that staff are usually informed, but the system that we work in maybe hasn't really changed to be more trauma specific. So the trauma specific would be utilizing specific trauma therapy models. So trauma-informed CBT, uh, EMDR, things like that. And staff in this way would be more confident in the work that they're doing with folks that are traumatized and their approach with clients. And the system would also respect this ideology. So the system would change. So when you think of, when I talk about systems being mindful of trauma, what do you think that means? So you think of somebody that goes in, that gets picked up by police or goes into Department of Corrections. How trauma-informed are they, is that system? Probably not very. Not very. What about um, DCF having to go in and do an investigation and possibly remove a child from a home? How trauma-informed is that, is the child welfare system? Hopefully very, but not very much. So I know when I worked in Florida, um, the child welfare system, if they were going to move a kid, they'd go pick the kid up at school, they'd already have their stuff packed, and they'd bring him to a new place. Not trauma-informed at all, right? No preparation for the kid, right? So the systems that we work in, so we might be very mindful of trauma, but the mental health system, let's be honest, is not very trauma-informed. I looked at your eval. 
Same, same as the one I have to do, long, right? What happens if somebody has come in six times and it's the same person? You do the whole eval again? Well, sort of populate it. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's good. So you can populate it. So you wouldn't necessarily have to go back through and ask them all the same questions. Some places you might. We have a right? follow-up that's a, an abbreviation of the... Perfect. Well, if I see someone that I saw like last week, I always ask them, what's changed? Yep. At the end of the Perfect. You know, what's the Family difference? history, we don't have to... Yeah, a lot of the... Go yeah. back through some of that again. I ask for changes. Right. What about paperwork they would have to sign if they're a readmit a month later? We have minimal... We have discharge instructions. <clears throat> okay. Consent for treatment. Yeah, which just started like two days ago. Okay. So we don't have a lot of paperwork overall. The ER might have its own set. True. Because they're, they're filtering through the ER before they get to you. They're triaging them in, out there Most, first, yeah. right? Yeah. And then potentially need to be medically cleared. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. Okay. So there's still a process. We're sometimes like the fourth or fifth person to ask them the information. There you go. So that the system is not really trauma-informed. So by the time they get to you, they're having to retell the thing over and over and over yeah, again. I've already told Plus, everybody. Right. right. I've already told they everybody that. They have to take off all their clothes. Another great point. So the system, and this is no one's fault in here, right? That's, this is the system we work in. It's the same if somebody was brought into DOC, right? They're going to do a strip search. Mm -hmm. Well, I have it's safety. Right. And we safety. People carry weapons. It is safety. But how do we take the information? So if we're trauma-informed, we're assuming this person coming to us has experienced trauma. And now we're saying, well, we're concerned about your safety and everybody else's, so we need, you, we need to take your clothes. And you're going to put on a hospital gown. We need to do that, but not very trauma-informed, correct? correct? So the system, how do we find a balance? And that's the hard part. How do we find a balance between Safety, which is obviously important, right? I've talked to, to some of the folks in here about how people sneak in razors. So very important because if somebody sneaks something in to hurt themselves. Medications in their bra. Medica know, it, sure. It has to be done. It so has to be done. You suggest we do it. Can't they, they give them their clothes back after it's been searched? Well, not that shoelaces and belts and things. If so shoelaces been, and belts. Mm -hmm. You know? We have them stripped down. They have razor blades in their mouth. Mm -hmm. the, you know, right. you're going to get something in. You, yeah. You're that determined. So if they strip down a razor blade in their mouth, it doesn't really have to do with them sneaking in their clothes. They could still sneak it in their clothes or in their shoe or into their sock, yeah. mm -hmm. potentially. Maybe even if you had to do it, maybe something a little bit more. The, the, the hospital gown is so ah, out there. You know? mm -hmm. Something a little bit more. Like some sweatpants and a t-shirt. Yep. So if we have somebody watching people 24 hours a day, I'm trying to understand where the threat is for <laughs> so, uh, shoelaces. You're trying to understand blinked. that. He, you, I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. Somebody blinked Yeah. when they were watching them. And the person took oh. the razor blade and cut themselves. There was one just recently. She went in, She had a bandage because she had been cutting. They, they put a bandage on her arm. She went into the bathroom, took the bandage, and tried to wrap it around her neck. I mean, you know, you just can't. And then, and then what do you do, pick and choose? Like, which yep. people should be, you know, taking their clothes and which ones shouldn't? Right. You can't do that because then you're discriminating between. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's, it has to be a, across the board, a standard procedure. I think I our foundation may be trauma-informed, and I think the ER's foundation may be safety-informed. Mm -hmm. Well, and you also have Often to. in opposition. Sure, and you also have to be safety informed because we're talking about people potentially sneaking razor blades in and, and hurting themselves. So Jeff McKee is talking about trying to find a way to <clears throat> people their clothes back after they've yeah. been screened. You're not gonna get a hundred percent. We don't get a hundred percent now. But um, if we're wanting to be trauma informed and mm -hmm. uh, provide a therapeutic and safe environment, that it's got to be safety and um, sure. whether that'll happen or not, I don't know. But Yep. Because I know if I had to go into crisis and you said, well, we need all your clothes, how vulnerable do you feel just sitting there in a hospital gown? Mm -hmm. Right? And now you're coming in. So that's, 
in a way that's almost a power differential too, right? Now you're coming in, you're sitting there, you're dressed, uh -huh. and I'm sitting there in this gown, mm -hmm. cold. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, look, we work with people that wear pajamas. Yeah, <laughs> wear scrubs. Yeah. So, but taking into consideration, yes, you have to be concerned about your safety, client safety, other client safety. So maybe giving some more time to explain to the person. I'm really sorry, you know, our policy is I have to, we have to take your clothes, we're gonna give you a gown. Um, if we can, after we get an opportunity to talk to you, maybe I can give you back your sweatshirt. You know, the our crisis department where we worked at, they would get their clothes back, but they would take the string out of the hoodie, right? They would take the shoelaces out of the shoes and keep them in a bag, but they get their, put their shoes back on. They would get their pants, but not the belt. Um, so they were given their clothes back with being mindful of things that they could harm themselves with. But also just keeping in mind, how can I maybe explain that? I'm sorry that we have to do that. It's for your safety. It's for other people's safety. I think the hospital does that. I think they do. A fairly yeah. Some, some do. Some, some do. do. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some do. Yeah. Yeah. Some use the power right. yeah. angle. Like, yeah. 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 They have to do this or else yep. you won't get this kind of. Yeah. So we'll. All has to do with personalities. Yes. Right. And every and job I think part has the same of being thing. trauma right. informed as well is you know we see a lot of borderlines. Yep. Experience a lot of trauma, but you have to set limits and boundaries. Or yes. Or walk all over you. Correct. So maybe we're not looking like we're trauma informed because we're not being nice to them, but we have to establish a certain. I mean, you have to. Sure. It's part of life. Yeah. yeah. We sure. Have to do it. We have to deal with stuff like that. Yeah. It's not. I don't think it's so much about what you do. It, it's it's how you right. explain Correct. it and right. involve the person. Yeah. In that, um, to be able to do the work that we do and and yeah. for safety. Yeah. It's um, just hard when someone lacks insight. Mm -hmm. they, right. You know, you're trying to. <laughs> then we're doing this because of your behaviors. You, keep, you know, you have to be careful what you yep. say. Yep, you, you do. But you I do think have it's the language of have, you know, as soon as you use the word must have. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. Limited. Yep. If you don't. You the power yeah. struggle there yep. already. <laughs> so then you're going to get what? Resistant clients. You can't come back from that. <laughs> you can't come back from that. So it could be just a shift in the wording. Language. You must do this. Yeah. You have to do this. You know, I'd like you you know, we'd really like you to change out of your clothes. It's really for the safety of everybody. And I recognize a lot of the stuff that we are talking about and we'll continue to talk about, all well and good that maybe if you have two people in crisis, when you're slammed, a lot harder, right? To be mindful of these things, to have the time to talk to people, to have the patience. So. And one of the things that we have no control over is the hospital bed situation. Oh, right. Are spending five days in the emergency room, like in jail, waiting yep. for the next, you know, Jordan. right? Yep. Yeah. And how do you talk to that person? And like, it's a 15 year old kid specifically, and I had a real problem with this. He'd been there for five days, and I'm going in, and the only thing I can do with the kid is say, "You're right. This is not fair. Yep. This is really horrible situation." I'd feel the same way if you were, and I even encouraged him to journal. Great. What he's going through and use it, you know. Maybe he could fight the system one day himself. Yep. But um, it, it's, yeah, I mean, all this stuff is really good and everything, but that's the thing that gets me the most, is having to watch somebody. I think all of us. Yeah. Are, yeah. So again, we're traumatized. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's the system you work in, right? Yeah. You work, that, that's nothing that you can control or change, unfortunately. You can't push the process well, through. I don't know that yeah. that's true. Okay. I mean, part of the dialogue that we're having now with the emergency room is, the care and treatment that people get while they're there. And so we're starting to meet with them and start to talk about these things. Excellent. And one of the things that I'm going to be advocating for is trauma-informed training. Yep. For people that are working in, we call it the East Wing, which is a locked five-bed section of the emergency yeah. room. Yeah. Well, and that's what we had, we had talked about when I was there. I was really asking, well, how are the techs trained? Who are these PSAs? How are they trained? What, you know, what does the, hosp what does the hospital do in training? 
terms of training their staff. Sure. Well, Cody, Cody I shared some information. That, he did. That, that the techs, if I remember correctly, the lead techs are trained and then they bring the information down to the sitters. Trickle down? Yeah. <laughs> he, informally. Yeah, he was like, well, I got to, I got to go to a training and here's a PowerPoint uh -huh. on what we learned. I think so they're the same CPI that we go through here. Okay. They have additional trauma training. I trauma no, I think it's See? CPI uh, training that we go through, uh, which has no trauma lens. Yep. I mean, I think it, you know, at its common sense level it does, but there's no specific information about trauma-informed care at all. So I don't know that they have specific trauma training. So that might be a greater conversation to start to have. That was my one slide at the beginning, taking this information and maybe mm -hmm. starting to disseminate out to the other folks that you work with that are employed by the hospital that maybe you don't have control over how they're trained, but opening a discussion. Um, and I mean, I was doing some trainings on the refugee stuff over at the hospital too, so it can be open to kind of them accessing some more supports for their staff as well. Yeah, sometimes we can feel like we can't change the culture over there, but yep. mm -hmm. you know, when you have something common for care, which everybody's trying to get on board mm -hmm. with, then you, then you have something that they, they can hang on to and, yep. and ignore, you know, you can, they will be on board with that. Yep. We have a contract coming renewal July 1st we can make a request as sure. we look at that contract that their staff will be trauma informed in the environment that we're working in. That's an so excellent way. Nurses, I mean, yeah. 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 There's too many the cooks in the kitchen, really. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. And it's tough if they, if they see three, four people before they even get to you. You know, you don't necessarily have any conversation or say in how they're treated before yeah. they kind of are. It takes one of these people yep. saying something to them that triggers them, and then there's all that. Really. Well, <laughs> well it, was, it was the same thing in the crisis department I worked. Police would drop people off, so we had um, an office where, and I usually worked the four to midnight shift, which was the worst one because it was the busiest. So police would drop, bring people in in handcuffs, hand us the Baker Act that says this person is threatening to kill themselves. That was it, sign the bottom of it. And they would often tell people when they pick them up, all you have to do is just go talk to somebody for like a half hour and then they'll let you go. Same language here. Yeah. Right? They hand us the Baker Act, which is a legal document that we have to keep them for 72 hours, at least until they see a psychiatrist and get ass assessed. So then the police officer leaves, right? And then we go to meet with them. Well, I'm sorry that's not the case. You're going to be here at least overnight. You're going to see a psychiatrist in the morning. Now that person flies off the handle. Right. Now they have to be restrained, right? So the struggle is, is real. You know, it's not always, you don't always have a say in kind of how they get to you. And if they're pissed off at the system by the time they get your door in crisis and you have an opportunity to talk to them. So, you know, I do understand, you know, from our work that it's difficult. It's difficult. And you can be doing the best work and the doctor talks to them one way and demeans them or puts them down or is frustrated because this is the sixth time in two months that they've come in. Yeah. Right? That's the case with, you know, at least a handful of clients. Sure. And they, they see them coming and they like, Roll their eyes. But so do we. I mean, I do. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's we all do. But well, I'm so also so aware of it. We have yes. Like, it's a difference. We have an awareness. I'm yes. aware of my counter transference, yeah. and I can repackage that as needed. Yeah. That's the the big difference yeah. there. And it might be venting to your colleagues outside of yeah. where clients can hear and see you. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I can't believe this person's here again. Mm -hmm. That I think is fine. I mean, we all need to do that. I do it with my clients all the time. But hopefully we let go of that by the time we meet right. with them. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. And don't hold it against the person. My God, seriously? Like, what is your deal? You were just here. Yeah, right. Are you med seeking again? We're not supposed to say what we think. You right? can say, you can say that entire same thing. sentence in a different way, yeah. and it would be completely fine. Right? Sure. Right. Oh, my gosh, you're here again. I'm so sorry to hear that. There you go. <laughs> So 
What constitutes a crisis? <laughs> Not enough resources to deal with the stress that the person is presented with in that moment. Okay. No, crisis is personal too. It's the person believes they're in crisis. What we might think is not a crisis is to that person Absolutely. in that moment is a crisis. Yep. Because they lack the coping skills, what have you, to deal with something that we would consider very minor. But to them, it's a big deal. So they come to you, and whatever they're going through is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. Right? They are in crisis. Right. Now they come to you and they say, I need help, I'm in crisis. And you do your assessment. And what do you say? No, you don't meet criteria. Right? For inpatient? Or? I don't know that they often come in for inpatient per se. Yeah. So how would, you, how would you interact with that person if they're, they say they're in crisis, I need help, but they're not actively suicidal? You figure out which level of care can meet their current mental health needs. OK. So, Both word. <laughs> I mean, if, if you're in crisis, like Peggy said, somebody, something might be a crisis for somebody, and it's not for another person. I had a guy call yesterday on the phone, and he was he had moved down here two weeks ago from Illinois. Met a guy on Facebook, <laughs> and now the guy's being mean to him, and it was just really ridiculous. But he was in crisis, and I thought, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know? But we just talked about what resources he could use. So with their time is on yeah. the surface. Often has very little to do with I mean, the intensity of the emotion that's underneath it doesn't have to do with necessarily I met somebody who's not being nice to me. Like, yep. You know, we have to like look beneath, know that there's another story going on there. I mean, I think a lot of times, you know, we get, well, they're not suicidal, so they're not in crisis. Well, I don't think that's true at all. Right. Like, you don't have to be suicidal to be in crisis. You also don't have to be suicidal to be admitted. Mm -hmm. You know, so. You gotta be homicidal. No. <laughs> not that either. Sometimes the case can be made for stabilization. If right. you're not yep. eating, not sleeping, or you know, certain things are going on. That's why it's important yeah, to ask all those questions. questions. And, and ability to function. Mm -hmm. The problem is, in crisis, do you scratch the surface or do you go digging? Because yep. you don't want to unearth something sure. that like, is going to be a huge fallout that the person isn't. Motivated or interested or, or able, able, yeah, to manage. Correct. So, you know, it's a delicate balance in there of what you ask, what you don't ask, what you think is going on. What I think you're it depends. To say. In some sense, in our view of what our role is there, also, mm -hmm. you know, are we the ones that provide that level of stabilization? Are we the re resource that provide referrals to the people that will? Right. You know, what are we, and I think it, it shifts for each person that we see. Sometimes we are we're providing a more substantial substantial role, I think, for people. And I think for some it's really resource seeking, it's referrals to other resources kind of stuff. Yep. So, um, and so what about if somebody calls the crisis line? So I, that was another one of my questions, trying to understand the, the process in Vermont, too. So it, go, it would go to Marsha or Tina usually right during the day. So what about in the evening? Would you folks sometimes answer some of those calls? Answering service. Answering service. Answering service. So they pay just when we call them back, we get the name of the person and the phone number and then we call the person. So what if they call the answering service and they say, I have a gun to my head? They Hold on a second. Just, okay. They pay just, they keep the person on the line. Okay. And they would they send a nine one one on our pager and then they connect the two calls. We don't do any call back other than to okay. the answering service. Facilitate. Okay. So how often are you folks maybe doing crisis work over the phone with someone? All the time. All the time? Most of our work is phone. I mean, we phone. Not time spent per se, but the volume or the... Hits. Yeah, the hits. It's a good word. Yep. It's phone stuff, not ER stuff. And a lot of it is social support. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, yeah, and like when I say, crisis to them, but it feels like social support to us. They don't have yep. support in yep. this community. I'm depressed. I have nobody to talk to. So really, a lot of them just looking for validation mm -hmm. just for an ear, yeah. just someone where it's sometimes the one person in their life that mm -hmm. is that non-judgmental. Mm -hmm. well, yep. We have to respond to them. Right? Yep. And we yeah, have, we have to, to respond to them. <laughs> right. We don't have a choice. Right. I'm not case managers. 
Yeah. Very true. So the sheet that I handed out um, has some really great questions. So is your work tra trauma informed? So that gives some really great questions just to kind of think about it. And is what you're doing trauma informed? So can you explain to a survivor, and these are, I just wrote a, a couple up here. Can you explain to a survivor what trauma is, including common effects? Can you recognize signs of trauma even if a person doesn't verbally tell you? Are you comfortable asking about traumatic experiences and hearing the responses? Are you comfortable actively listening to difficult feelings and emotions? Can you make people feel more comfortable by the way you ask questions? Do you acknowledge to the survivor the difficulties and courage involved in talking about their trauma? Can you respond to the experience the person shares with belief and validation? So those are just a few. The, um, the sheet I gave you has some really great questions about trauma-informed work, trauma-informed systems, how you handle things. Um, also think not just for yourself, but the text that you work with. How might you answer these questions for some of them? Do you think they're comfortable asking about traumatic experiences and hearing the answers? Some of them might be. I, I would think that they'd stay away from that. Well, yeah, and sometimes that's one of the issues we have with mm. text is the boundary issues. Yep. Just like becoming best friends with, mm. you know. Um, yeah. You know, that so to get in to have a personal relationship meeting we went to yesterday there was some like is, is there some flirting going on with certain clients you know uh, like, that happened you know it's like yeah so now you have a 18 19 20 year old female who is probably a little bit borderline and cuts and comes in and is in crisis and now she has this 20 year old tech has no training really just yep. one train one workshop sure yeah. and is talking to her and showing interest so that's viewed as wow this is a male that maybe thinks I'm pretty or nice or interesting and uh, taking interest in me and asking me questions right which can be really dangerous we know with those those types of individuals that have most likely, in a lot of cases, with those females, have probably had some type of sexual trauma. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and the person we were talking about yesterday is like one of the things that may keep her coming to the ER. <laughs> sure. Reinforces that. Yep. Reinforcing. Definitely, potentially reinforcing the behavior. So, am I getting something? How do you handle that? How do you, what do you do it's like you, you, yeah. you almost like to kind of be not too nice. <laughs> the challenge to them is educating them that, and yeah. I've, I've always been in the stance of I don't think they're trying to be harmful in any way. I think sure. it's a lack of awareness. Sure. That, oh, yeah. That they mind don't mind understand. Mind. Yep. Oh, yeah. They, so, it's actually asking them to fight against their natural instinct to talk to people sometimes mm -hmm. and try to be helpful. But they, we, yeah, they need training. They're right. Yeah. It's correcting the writing reflex in the MI terms of. Well, and it's tough because your role, I mean, you're already doing so much to, yeah, to manage, to, and you don't have time to, to correct. Manage the text. You don't. don't. Do and it's not your responsibility either. Mm -hmm. But you're seeing these things and you're recognizing that it's harmful to the folks that you're working with. And so it's like, what do you do? There's only so much time in your day and patience yeah. that you have. But they have no background to understand it either. Like, Correct. You can explain until we're blue in the face, but they have no foundation. Exactly. To support the knowledge we might be trying to provide them in the moment. So it's so also safe to say that the people, some of the people we work with, have been traumatized, and I think we absolutely overlooked yeah. that. You know, poor boundaries is a pretty good indication that <coughs> something didn't go so well. Yep. The the thing that I'm hoping for by the end of this training is that we're able to identify the things that we're currently doing that are trauma-informed mm -hmm. and that we need to recognize and um, continue to do those things, but also looking to examine are there things that we're doing that could be more trauma-informed, I think you said earlier, 
in terms of other systems that we have in place, yep. or are there uh, ways that we interact with people that may not be as welcoming as we would like, and given the constraints of the work that we have, I'd like to, as a team, be saying, okay, these are areas that I think we can make some improvement in terms of being more welcoming for people with trauma, and we have a commitment <coughs> as a team to try and do that. And um, I'm hoping that either, either by the end of today or at some point in the future, we end up having this consensus about um, ways that we might be able to. Um, yep. And if you have the opportunity, like you said, to look at the um, um, whatever you have that's coming up. Columbia. No, I forgot. No, what the was training the, the, with uh, SAMHSA. No, you, I thought you said something about um, the contract or something. Right. So looking at that and using that as a, a basis of saying, you know, we're, we're seeing some of these things with the techs. We recognize that it comes from, you know, a lack of awareness. We think they would benefit, you know, instead of making it sound like a negative thing, like these people are harming the clients. We think they would really benefit from some more knowledge, from some more information. Is the hospital willing to, you know, have somebody come in and give them some understanding of maybe how their background impacts their work with their clients and you know the boundary issues. Could you not do cross training with the hospital and have this team do some training with the hospital techs and vice versa? That'd be good. Sure, that would be I awesome. That would be something to look at. Well the hospital try. recognizes the need um, and um, I have uh, offered that and they uh, Jeff he was very interested in that. So just started meeting awesome. um, with them to start to look at some of these things. So it's going to be interesting to see where it goes. But as far as your, I mean, you do a lot of these trainings, and how about your role over there and going in with the techs and doing the training? At the I'm ha we started talking about that when I was over at Crisis, and I was kind of asking some of the questions. And I said, I would be open to that from some of the trainings I started doing around the refugee issues. I was working with. Um, a couple of the social workers over there that had the department. Christy? Yes, Christy and Jessica. Mm -hmm. um, so if they have any say, I don't know how much they dip their toe into the crisis area with the techs and whatnot, mm -hmm. but I'm certainly open to it if it means, mm -hmm. you know, educating some people and helping them just be more informed and do their work a I little bit better. Training too. I think that those techs are really hung knowledge hungry. I think so. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of thrown into the lion's pit without training. Yeah. It's like, you know, you're dealing with some difficult Absolutely. and they really don't have The challenger, I think, for me are the PSAs and not even the techs. The techs yeah. work on PSA. Yeah. You would have at least a little, maybe yeah. maybe a touch more of that yeah. training knowledge base. Sure. It's the PSAs that, I think by definition, the role is safety first and yeah. everything else secondary. Yes. The very nature of the role is to not, again, not necessarily look at it from a trauma-informed care, but a, mm -hmm. more of a police perspective of yeah. my job is to keep you safe no matter what, and then everything else comes after that. That's it, a challenge. That yeah. Their initial training completely undermines, not, not undermines per se, but a little bit undermines. Yep. Um, I think the system dilemma. though has an obligation to train the PSA. And there's a way to do Absolutely. both. Absolutely. Like you said that, you know, you can do both. You can be safe and trauma-informed, but... Definitely. Well, I think police, too. So we talk police over. How are we going to train the police on it? I'm, I'm working on that, too. <laughs> that's going to be a problem. That be a I'm, I'm, trying to get, I'm trying to get my foot in the door over there, too. Yeah, cool. yeah. Well, at least you're doing quite a bit of that, you know, yeah. here and there, you know. Well, but they have the same kind of, you know, safety yeah. right. is paramount. Right. So how do you have, integrate the two and be trauma-informed and also keep yourself safe on the job. Yeah, it, some of the guys do it well, some of them don't do very good at all. Yep. Yeah. And they so never, everybody, yep. because of their personality. Personality, I think it comes down to personality a lot too. Well, and the way you started the slide, you know, how did you get into that job? Becoming a police officer is quite a bit different than going into the mental health field in a yep. lot of ways, for some. You just did a training on refugees down the police department, didn't you? No, I did it with, um, I haven't yet, I would like to though. Um, Adam Sansic had me come and talk to the, oh, the lit team, right? 
<laughs> yeah. So there's the gentleman from DOC that's there. The other officer, Gregory, I think is his name, that does the. Yes, yeah, so that does the outreach stuff with you guys, I think. With Leisha. Yes. Um, so he was there. So I chatted with him a little bit more about yeah, some of this stuff, too. too. He's pr obviously very open to it. Um, so I think it would be great to do something with the police. Um, they're kind of the first line of defense a lot of times. And maybe the state legislators and have them sit in a bed for five days. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we need your clothes. We, we got Here's a hospital room. gown. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. Give them a little insight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or have one of their kids be sitting there. Yeah. Like, that ain't going to happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So this is just, I'll try and move along a little bit. Um, this is just thinking about the pro, our agency and program. So do we even have a definition of trauma? How do we discuss trauma here? You know, we're talking a lot about the hospital. I think us as an agency, you know, have a little bit of work in this regard as well. Does our program, mine, yours, you know, any of, any of the different programs screen for trauma? Does any of the staff receive training when they start? You know, we just assume, all right, well, they're, they have a bachelor's degree in psychology. They know about trauma, right? They have a bachelor's degree in case management. They know about trauma. Maybe they don't. Um, so just some things to think about in terms of agency-wide. And again. You know, a lot of medical professional people have universal precautions for disease control. Yeah. It would be, a, you know, the same kind of thing. We wouldn't Great. love people for... Trauma, but Great point. Take universal precautions with each person. Wow, that's really you good. You never know who. Absolutely. And to what degree. Yeah, that's a great way of looking at kind of the analogy between the medical and us. Like diabetes. Just, and yep. But yeah, that's what the. So again. He puts on gloves and a mask. Yeah. <laughs> Trauma informed <laughs> mask. Put the hat on. Yeah. <laughs> So really the whole thing that we're talking about is changing the culture of the organization so everything is trauma-informed. And then it comes down to makes it easier on all of the work that we do if the processes that we work in are a little bit more trauma-informed. So I think we've kind of gone over this a bunch already. Um, so we, we can all understand that. Trauma is kind of the lens that people see things through. So if, I have, if I've had these experiences in my life, everything I view is going to be, you know, well, I have to always put up a fight. I have to always be ready that somebody's going to hurt me or I can't trust anybody. So their perception of things is through those experiences that they've had. But not necessarily conscious. Correct. Yep. Not necessarily aware of kind of where that's coming from. So some big, I have a little thing I want to do here. So the big kind of components with trauma-informed care is creating safety. Again, kind of hard dichotomy with how we view safety. So does the person feel safe if they're in a gown? Well, we need them to be safe and make sure they don't bring anything in with them. So that's a tough one. How do we help the client feel safe? Maximize opportunities for choice and control. Not much choice and control once they're in crisis. Well, one thing they do, again, it's just symbolic and it's a little thing, is they bring the menu down and they get to choose what they get to eat. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so that's small, th even small things like that, yep. Fostering connections. So anything that you can do to kind of build rapport, connect them to other services or supports. Managing promotions, self-regulation, um, building trust which is obviously really hard for anybody that has experienced trauma. Uh, empowerment. Also, they don't feel very empowered many times um, because of the experiences that they've had. So keeping those things in mind. So if we were to think of these kind of areas that make something trauma-informed, so safety, trust, collaboration, empowerment. So let's kind of go through this if maybe we didn't have those things. So 
As a provider, I don't have time to collaborate because I'm too busy making sure that I have enough billable hours. <laughs> As a provider, I assume you trust me because you came to me for help. But the reality is you don't know me and you're actually pretty scared of what might happen. But I'm not really thinking about this. Maybe I'm a, a home-based provider and I go into somebody's home and offer services. And there are all sorts of people coming in and out, right? You have a lot of services. So out here I am, another person coming in. You have DCF maybe there. That's part of what's going on. And even though I told you you're physically safe, so you're, you're safe, you're fine, um, it doesn't occur to me if you're emotionally safe. You don't really want to talk to me with all this activity around us, but you don't know how to say this to me without being labeled resistant and non-compliant. All you are is emotionally unsafe, but I don't know that. Then I hand you a thick packet of information to read and sign, right? Where's this uh, <laughs> thing we were talking about this morning? You are currently in trauma, in a trauma state, but you sign it because that's what you think you have to do to get services. I don't bother to ask you if you want to read it or have me help you read it. You call my agency looking for services, but speak limited English. I can tell you speak Spanish, and I know my agency has a policy for accessing a phone interpreter, but I don't know what the policy is, and we haven't really used it a lot. It is clear I can't help you when I hang up. This is something we're actually working on that is an issue, uh, that we're trying to get some limited English uh, and interpreter phone system set up. So you have a lot of people. You're involved with DCF, right? You've been, you've been in, and out, in and out of crisis. Your plan states you have to go to parenting classes every Wednesday. You just started a new job, and they won't let you take time off. You really want to work on your parenting skills, and you also want to keep this job so you can support your family. There are no options or choices for you because I don't research them or because the community has none. And instead of working with you on a creative solution, I enforce the plan. So how many people fail? Well, they don't make it to parenting class because they don't have transportation, or they don't have childcare, or they don't have a ride, or they have to be at work. You've participated in a leadership workshop offered by the local organization, and now you want to apply these skills in the community. You asked me how to do this um, in the agency. However, as an agency, I don't involve youth and family in decision making. We don't ask family and youth for input on policies. It doesn't occur to me or my agency to create opportunities for empowerment. So just some interesting examples of how we're not often trauma-informed and how we sometimes think we know the best thing or assume that the client can do all of these things and figure out all of these things that we set up for them. Um, and sometimes there's too much on their plate and they can't keep everything straight and they don't follow through with things. So I won't say too long on this because we've talked a lot about it, but in the crisis and in the ED where you guys are, how do you create safety? So small examples like Paul was saying about opportunities for choice or control. Not much control when you take their clothes. So how can we, is there a way to work around that? How are we able to foster connections given um, and kind of how are you hindered given the work that you do in crisis and kind of trying to integrate trauma-informed approaches. So I was trying to think of all the ones I couldn't. I forgot, um, what was the one I, uh, non-compliant, <laughs> resistant. resistant, right? So sometimes we, hothead, right? I, I mean, I've definitely used these. We've used attention-seeking before with a lot of borderline clients, right? They're attention-seeking. They just, they're superficial cuts, right? Um, they're just an addict. They're med-seeking. They're off their meds. They're manic. So trauma-informed also being mindful of the terminology we use. Um, and we know that, I, I know from the clients I work with, they'll come in and they'll just say, oh, I'm bipolar, borderline, ADHD, PTSD, OCD, right? <laughs> so they've, they've been through the system so much, their identity has become the diagnosis. 
as opposed to the diagnosis being something that, you know, maybe they're trying to work through as opposed to being their identity, which is really hard with folks that are frequent. And I think uh, another area is person first language mm. um, is really important in terms of how language matters. And if we call someone a schizophrenic, then we're contributing to that as a system as opposed to a person with schizophrenia. Um, it's more empowering and more um, sets of tone, I think, that uh, is more trauma-informed. Mm -hmm. One of my big issues is if somebody comes in and lists off their litany of disorders or diagnoses, <clears throat> and then if I read an assessment and somebody just lists something that somebody else had put as a disorder and doesn't really do their own due diligence to diagnose and determine if that's correct. Um, I had an intern I was working with and the, she, we, she was doing an assessment with somebody and the person said, I'm, I'm bipolar. And I said, well, what do you think? I said, did you assess to see if this person actually is manic? has depressive symptoms, if they've gone through any of that. And she's like, well, I don't think they're bipolar. And I said, then you don't have to diagnose them as bipolar. <clears throat> but some people will just, right? If you say you're bipolar, OK, well, you're bipolar. Right? So I'll ask people a lot of times, well, what does bipolar mean to you? Sometimes they don't even know. They might not even know what the symptoms are. They've just heard that, and somebody's diagnosed them with that. But maybe they've never had a manic episode. Maybe they just have major depressive disorder. So that, that's one of my big issues, too, is somebody that just kind of, you know, doctors that do that, that just continue a diagnosis. Well, that's what we do. I mean, if they're, they're on the pre-populated diagnosis, <clears throat> we, we, you know, we don't, that's not our, really our job to diagnose people. Yeah. But so we just keep it going. And so there's, a, I always have a question of when they have five diagnoses, mm -hmm. what's, What's Usually real? What's your cap clients and stuff? Yeah. yeah. They will list have schizophrenia and, and all, you know, it's just well, these you know, absurd diagnoses. We have a lot of constraints man. around yeah. what we can do in a very short period of time. Sure. And ideally, I think patient education is huge. It's really important. We don't always have the time to do it. But there are things that <clears throat> we should consider, like do we tell people um, what we've put in the note? maybe they should know, or do mm -hmm. they know that they have uh, access to their records, that they can get a copy of that evaluation <clears throat> if they wanted it. Yep. Um, uh, in terms of all those things that are working with people and informing them and educating them, um, there may be some small things that we can do that are not going to take more time, but that could have the person will come away from feeling they listen to me, they want me to know what's going on, and they, I feel empowered. And they'll maybe believe that um, with that kind of experience of being heard and listened to and worked with as opposed to having something done to them. Yep. And I think that that's, you know, if, if you had a family member go through crisis, that's what you would want for them. And I think, too, if there's a, a really heavy diagnosis, I don't particularly, so if somebody has schizophrenia, I don't know that I really want to continue that diagnosis unless I feel strong that that person has schizophrenia. So I'll, I'll give you an example. I was working with somebody um, in uh, like private practice, and young lady, significant trauma, horrific. And she said that she told a doctor at one point, she was going in to get med, she told a doctor at one point that in the moments when she was in the most severe mental pain, anxiety, she would occasionally hear screaming in her head. Schizophrenia. He diagnosed her with schizophrenia and gave her medication for schizophrenia, which she did horrible on and had such adverse side effects to because she wasn't schizophrenic. So then, she, because she was a client in my private practice, I wanted to follow up with her records here, so she signed a release for Rutland Mental Health. Auditory visual hallucinations, no family history indicating any significant mental health issues like that. 
Guess what the diagnosis was? Schizophrenia. Was it for a CRT eval? Nope. Mm. <coughs> I, I know for CRT, they're often forced to, to make sure they meet criteria. They have a certain <laughs> stringent state mm -hmm. um, predetermined diagnosis you must meet. But there was the nothing, right. nothing in this DNA on our end that gave any indication of anything even close to a schizophrenic diagnosis, and this person access one schizophrenia. I was appalled. Because somebody that's been traumatized, yeah, maybe at their worst moment when they're in crisis, they might hear screaming in their head. Yeah. Doesn't mean they're schizophrenic. It's it's yeah, absolutely. What was the follow-up follow with something like that? I, I, think, um, I think because we referred her to another program here, I ended up making a note in the chart that there was nothing to indicate schizophrenia as an active diagnosis. I mean, I sometimes want to challenge the diagnosis when I see people. I don't really have time. And I don't, yeah. They, should we be talking to clients about all these diagnoses that they come in with? Sure. It's like, do you know that you have all these diagnoses listed here? They, they, you know, <coughs> I note, I read, you know, the person has a history of blah, 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 mm -hmm. per their own report or yep. per documentation, per, yeah. and then go on with my note. Just so reflecting that it's not necessarily your right. understanding. This is what, you know, because sometimes we don't see them long enough to be sure. able to say don't. for sure. sure. I use depressive disorder, you know, NOS all the time. Yep. Or generalized anxiety because there's not enough. They're dysregulation. We don't have a lot of time to sure. definitely say, you know, it's this specific. Nor is it necessary, you know, yeah, it's important. Not really. I don't know if that needs to inform But I think we need to document that yeah. this is what they've told us or this is what the chart says, the history of, and then just go on with our own. For me, that almost put, when they come with like a litany, it almost kind of a red flag of yeah. trauma. Like, yeah. that's my immediate first thought is there's. For the provider or for the person? Both, Both. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> my big one is ADHD. I can't yeah. stand. Oh, I Everybody know. has ADHD, yeah. but ADHD can look like. Anxiety can look like ADHD. Trauma can look like ADHD. All these other things can look. That's why yeah. kid diagnosing a kid is so hard. So I can't stand many, ADHD. How many patients or clients have we seen that have no idea what they've been diagnosed? With? Yep. And how is that empowering for them in terms of recovery and um, working on improving their lives if they mm -hmm. don't know what they've been diagnosed and don't understand it? Mm -hmm. and, and how do they help themselves based on that so-called medical yep. condition? That, that seems more long-term, yes. like individual mm -hmm. patients. Sure. Yeah, you know, in crisis, we can't. We're limited. Yeah. Again, we're yeah. limited. You are limited. Part of it is, is there a role for us to play in that? And it's, it may be a small role. Sure. But. Mm -hmm. um, like you might want to talk with the doctor about. Exactly. You know, you look like this is something you, you, should, yeah. you should think about exploring or finding yeah. out more information about. Now that the diagnosis populates everything that's in there, I mean, we used to be able to, like, sometimes this episode is intoxication. Sure. You know, they may carry other diagnoses, but what we're seeing them for right this minute has nothing to do, well, yeah, nothing's... Sure. Not immediate. Right. right. But the but reason that they're moment. there is not necessarily because of whatever the list of diagnoses is, but sure. that's just automatically populated. Mm. And we can't, and the only way to not have it populate is to uncertify it, which we can't do if it's oh, a CRT client or right. a child client or something. We can't uncertify the diagnosis. diagnosis. Yep. Right. Yep. I mean, I guess we could technically. Episode, like, and sure. There's no way to do that, right? Right. Sure. And again, I've looked through your assessment. I mean, you have a, you're doing a lot, and we're talking about, you know, maybe a situation when you have a couple folks in there, not when you're slammed. So. I think Lynn makes a valid point that that's, uh, the diagnosis is something they should be talking about with their provider. Absolutely. Right? Because it becomes a label. And if they're in crisis and we say, oh, you're, you know, blah, 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 they're going to take that away with them. Yep. I, I, don't, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't go there. Mm -hmm. I don't. Yep. Do you, do you, sometimes I haven't done it in a while, but I say, I tell the patient just like what we're talking about, you are not your diagnosis. You are an individual human. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the challenges you're facing. But just kind of avoid the whole labeling yeah. Yeah. and mm -hmm. telling them the difficult, I mean, yep. the, the, the problem with labeling. Or these are, you know, because of all the things that you've been through, it's understandable that you're responding in this way. Mm -hmm. 
This is a normal reaction. Right. Healthy, a healthy yeah. reaction to a horrific experience that you've had. Acting this way, I'd be worried. <laughs> yeah. The other thing that uh, you know, I don't do a lot of screenings um, <coughs> uh, in the past year or so, but when I have, um, I, I inevitably would ask them if they understood what recovery was. Mm. Um, and m most people uh, that uh, I would asked that question would have no idea what that was. And I would explain that it's the expectation that people can recover from the mental health struggles that they have. It's, it's possible and it's expected. And it's not a life sentence. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that, um, and then uh, try to give them information about that. That's Absolutely. But we're set up to make it, I mean, even in our own CRT program, people are in CRT for life, basically. <laughs> It's not viewed as a temporary, um, you know, treatment option with really the highest outpatient level of care. Yep. At some point, you would hope that with enough care, they'd be able to graduate and step down to a lower level of care. But historically, at least from what I've seen, is that people are in CRT sentence. for their whole, yeah, their sentence is CRT. So very disempowering. Life, yeah. Yeah. And in fact, it's difficult for them to pull away from CRT because right. one, once you've been CRT, they for get decades, reliant on you know, that. Right. Yeah. And they've also, yeah, they become, I mean, we foster dependence, essentially. Mm -hmm. Not just us, but the mental health right. system. We Absolutely. Foster dependence. I mean, you talk about empowerment. Some people don't want to be empowered. Right. They mm -hmm. want you to make decisions. They're dependent. Yep. Yeah. And that's. Because that's personality. safe for them. Because that's safe them, for them. It's personality, <clears throat> and you're not. But it's our role to foster, you know. Yeah, like, to try. Not our crisis role. I mean, we can. Well, really give them a agree. choice. A lot and of people. if they choose and, not to, then that's. That's a well, choice. I was say a lot of people end up in crisis because they're being mm -hmm. pushed in their programs to be more independent, and then they uh, they hit crisis because I'm overwhelmed. I can't handle this. They they want me to they want me to pay my own rent. They want me the to. They, they don't, I, yeah, and don't they don't do home. small steps yeah. with them to work up to that. Great economy. Yeah. 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 But, there's no you step know. down plan. You know, again, in my experience, you know, my I've been here ten years almost, and, and there's no like real step down plan. It's you know, I mean, people graduate, of course, CRT, but it's not a common occurrence, you know, it seems. And they go up angry. They yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Drop out. <laughs> so out of curiosity, I, I had the opportunity to come over and see the new crisis space. What are your thoughts on the space and if it, how trauma sensitive it is? You mean New York? Your new crisis area. Not very. It's hit and miss. The rooms are very clean. Sometimes it's windows. Noisy, sometimes it's not. <laughs> not dark. Our office is more traumatizing. Yeah. <laughs> the what do you think it it looks like to a if a client's never come in to crisis and they're experiencing the new kind of crisis area? What do you think it would look like to them coming in, seeing the how the rooms are and the layout? Locked doors, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's people everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Talking Security loudly. Security guards, yep. guns, like mm -hmm. laughing, yeah. screaming. <laughs> I have to say, my first impression when I when I went in there it was like they looked like refrigerators. Yeah. The rooms. <laughs> I mean, they did. I mean, they're it's like Funny cold. <laughs> it's metal. It's cold. Mm -hmm. It's very harsh looking. Institutional. Institutional. Yeah. Right. So. That hurts, like an uninviting space. It looks scary. If I've never been in there before, that was like my first impression. I'm like, this looks scary. Mm -hmm. If I was coming in here on my worst day and I'm in a horrible space and I'm like, this is scary. You know, it looks like you're putting me behind this huge door that's this thick, that's like a vault. It reminds me of the horror film I watched last night. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> the only thing I can say is like, a lot of people I think think, well, I guess my crisis is Puts it in perspective pretty quick. Right. Really, this yeah, is I think I want to go home now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm ready to go home, yeah. <laughs> this was very light. Kind of this. <laughs> this is where you come for help, really? Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I'll say too, the, the place where I used to work, the crisis center, I would always tell people I would not want to send my worst enemy there. It was a horrible place. It was dirty. Um, 
it did not have a, a sense of we're here to help you. Um, you know, the office where we were was this glass, and we were we were on this side, and you were over there. <clears throat> so, I, all this stuff we're talking, it's not uncommon to hear and your crisis department. It's it's this institutionalized mentality. It's how we still have a long way to come, I think, in terms of you know how we treat and look at mental illness. Um, part of that is safety. Not, sure. Not having people that are using the space in the conversation about what the space should be. There you go. Like us. us. I mean, we, yeah. we us. showed us the blueprints and showed us where our office is going to be and showed us, and what do you think? Like, what do you, say? you don't really have a choice at that point. Here's the blueprints. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, hire my own architect. I'll resubmit them. Even just some minor suggestions. I know. Colors or just things. Yeah. What could. might the clients have might think? In an office without a room? I mean, a window? No. Right. Never. Yep. Mm -hmm. They could have just. Uh, you know. So how can you? You know. Okay. Keeping safety in mind. How could you maybe? make it a little bit more inviting looking, you know, even being mindful of the things that you have to consider and not have it look like a huge refrigerator kind of vault door that they're going into. You know, even from the trauma-informed lens, you know, the, I don't know if you actually, what, did you actually go into any of the rooms mm -hmm. go in? Did you see how there's no clearance, basically, between the door opening and where they keep the, the, the bed? Bed, yeah. And the sink. Yeah, and the I mean, sink, so yep. part of it for me is that, I like to create as much privacy as I can, but sometimes I'm, if I'm feeling unsafe, I need sure. to keep the door open, and that has now eliminated the trauma-informed Sure, comes, sure. Because I've no longer created a safe environment, but it, in my head, it's like, well, didn't you think about this prior to building? Like, how is there no clearance? Like, I have to move, you know, yeah. like, move those, those rolling tables they have out of the way. I look like an idiot half the time because <laughs> things are spilling and falling. <laughs> It's it's like it's absurd, like Very how humble. incompetent yes. we look sometimes. Yeah, like, the navigating the logistics of this Oops. absurd architectural design. Yeah, it's my mantra is, oh, they made these they made these rooms too small. And that, I always yeah. joke with, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a hopefully disarming technique. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that was going back to kind of the collaboration piece. You know, nobody really asked people that are going to be in the rooms what they would need or what would make them feel safe or comfortable or feel that maybe I can trust this person. Well, the hospital doesn't want them coming in, period. <laughs> so, Is that their subtle way of saying no. it? <laughs> Close for business? They don't want them coming in, period. But they give them a fancy TV. I know. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. I mean, the only yep. thing that I can do when I go into a room is there, the light is on a dimmer, so I do give them the, the option of okay. how Me bright. Too. Okay. I, I always do yeah. that. That's good. That gives them, it's like, yeah. this is your first choice. Yeah. 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 Sm whatever you can give them, small little things like that can make a difference. Chairs, like, on the same level as yeah. that. Yeah. Not above, you know, S looming over, over them. Yeah. People it's, stand over them. But they're the only the two things I can Like do. the doctor that comes <laughs> in. Yeah. <laughs> Looks very official. I mean, with the trauma informed care, I, I, just in case the other week I had this guy that, a lot of trauma had been drinking, made some statements, didn't want to stay, didn't want to be admitted, wanted to go home. Dad wanted him to wait until morning. I got him settled. He was very anxious. Okay, I'll stay the night. Doctor went in there, put the lights on, mm -hmm. all the stuff. Uh, so, I'm going to give you more out of you. You don't have to stay if you don't want to. Uh, yeah. One of the first I things I ask people yeah. like, right away is if they need anything to drink or eat. Like, Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Can I get you anything? Yeah, yeah. Do you need a blanket if it's cold in there? Yeah, always, like, maybe five times it's been yes. <laughs> but, but that's okay. Um, you're, but, yeah, it's those little, you're, those like, little things yeah. that you're showing some care and concern. But Can I find I, myself at times not always asking. <laughs> those those, are my, those, those chairs in there, not beds, because yeah. Yeah. I try I to bring a chair in for people, but. It takes Where? forever. You yeah. move one chair over here, and then mm. you the and after you move their trays, you get up and get the water, and then you <laughs> spill your whatever, <laughs> or their drink. It's a good thought, yeah, I wonder. But chairs, yeah. two chairs work nicely if, think you, about that, if yeah. you can hmm. maneuver everything, push the two, the bed over against the wall more. Yeah. That actually used to be the nice thing about being people were to fast track <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it was two almost, chairs. Yeah. So how are we doing for time? Uh, Got to move along, I guess. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'll have time to show you this video. If we have time at the end, I'll come back to it maybe. But 
if you have any opportunity to, I think her whole video is actually on um, YouTube. Tonya Kane is this woman's name. Tonier, T-O-N-I-E-R, C-A-I-N, Tonier Kane. Um, I heard her speak in Florida, and she is actually heading up this trauma-informed care initiative across the country. Mine is, of course. <laughs> Have you been next door? Not yet. Uh, that's where the main part of the agency, there's a receptionist over there. Okay. She can probably better help you. Okay. you or know help. Here. How much time do I have? Uh, 20 minutes. Perfect. I talked to the police officer down, and he said you could just park on the no parking side of the street. Okay, sure. cool. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Just go straight across. Thank you. Of course, I'm parking the wrong spot this morning. Mm -hmm. um, so Tonya Kane is kind of heading up this trauma-informed care initiative across the country, and she spoke in Florida, and it was so incredibly powerful. I was actually trying to convince um, Doug to see if we could pay to have her come up here and do a training, but she's super expensive, and he wasn't really on board with paying for it. <laughs> um, but she talks about her early trauma as a child. Mom was an addict, very abusive. Father wasn't in the picture. She got into drugs at a young age, oh, I think I've seen got into the um, legal system very quickly. She had like 35, 40 arrests in a short period of time, had a couple kids taken away by DCF, the impact of having your children taken away, the impact of being in the criminal justice system, no one asking her anything about what happened to her, why she got to this point, no offering of services of any kind. And she shares her whole story in, um, in a couple of these videos. This one is just her talking about the trauma-informed approach. Um, phenomenal videos. Um, I think it's in three different parts, but it's called Healing Neen. Um, is the name of the, the piece of the video. And I can s I'll send my whole PowerPoint to Mike and he can share yeah, this with you guys. I have a couple people that aren't here. Yep, and so he can share this with you and you can watch the videos. But excellent um, proponent of trauma-informed care on, in all different types of systems. So DOC, DCF, um, you know, mental health. So we've talked about that. We'll keep going a little bit. Go past that. So, I mean, we kind of already know this, why the work is so challenging, because as part of trauma, we have emotional dysregulation where they, people can't really regulate what's going on in their lives because they've never been able to do that, or they've never had the opportunity or been taught the skills to do that. Um, so I don't know. I'm going to skip over some of this stuff. Um, this is just about how the brain is impacted. So from the earlier trauma occurs in childhood actually changes the structure of the brain. So we wonder why these people can't figure this stuff out and can't learn and can't you know, manage their emotions is because Literally, their brain has been constructed in a way to be on high alert all the time. For the title of your last slide from the book, Body Keeps the Score? Um, the Body Keeps Score is a book by Phenomenal. Bessel van der Kolk. Right. Really good. Another good one is Trauma and Recovery by Judith Herman. This is an older one, but this one is phenomenal. She required reading. Yeah. Ex it's yeah. very, it's a, um, he's like one of the gurus on trauma. Um, he was trying to get um, developmental trauma disorder in the DSM-5, but they didn't go for it, and he was really pissed off. Uh, really easy. He makes it easy to read. It's not a very like complex book in the way he writes it. Talks a significant amount. The most interesting, I thought, was the significant part that attachment plays 
Do you remember that part where you talked about attachment? So people, children that don't have a secure attachment and a caregiver, how that basically lays the foundation for all of this buildup of later trauma, substance use, um, suicidality, self-injurious behavior. Uh, phenomenal book if you have the opportunity to read it. Yep. Yep. So that. Trust so you know. nobody responding. You know the, the child. Nobody responds that are crying. Mm -hmm. So then they have to learn a different way to self soothe. So they don't have a caregiver that's receptive if they're sitting in a dirty diaper for eight hours. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's yep. Not, it's not a new concept. No, it's not. One bit. This is. <laughs> we've known, we've this, known this forever. <laughs> for you, yeah. Right. But just the way he connects it to kind of how it it impacts even more significantly than we thought, like right. later trauma. I wonder why this isn't more yeah. out there, you know? Yeah. Why we're not training new people, even in the agency, like when people because first come in. Because you can't interview in. a, a six-month-old child. They, you know, the answer is they're, they're assuming, but I mean, obviously through looking yes, at children that were. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, like training, you know, like people oh, to, training, to yeah. view it from that perspective, right? Then. It should be in the curriculum in elementary school, actually. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, yeah, for teachers. You know, teachers, yeah. Parenting classes. Teachers, yeah. Major element, too, is um, instead of asking the question, what's wrong with you, asking the question, what happened to you, Yep. is a huge difference in terms of using language. There's that was ACE. that was a big piece by Tonya Kane, the what happened to you, and the ACE study. The ACE study was really eye-opening study. Yep. Um, it's a great TED Talk if you haven't listened to it from the woman who did the ACE. Yeah. Phenomenal. What's it called? ACE Adverse study? Childhood ACE. ACE. Study, think, Adverse Childhood Experience Study. Yeah. I, think we, I think we might have talked about that when I was over. Was I don't a, know if it came up. It was a huge retrospective study. And, yeah, Done it. Um, pediatrician, somewhere in California, I think. Oh, what was it called? I can't remember the hospital now. But it's yeah. a TED Talk? It's, yeah, it's a TED Talk. The moment that, yeah, if you search phenomenal. ACEs, there's a ton. ACE. ACE. Adverse Childhood Experience uh, okay. Study. Um, Love yeah. <laughs> um, so the discussion has been great. I have a bunch more slides, but so I'll just have to blow through them a little bit. But then I'll send you all this. So we've talked a lot about all of these things. So what can we do? And I and I recognize that your time is pulled in a lot of directions. And I recognize that you don't always have the opportunity to maybe have the conversations with the clients that you would like to. So I understand that. So I guess making the best use of the time that you have. And if there's a day that you're not slammed and you maybe can spend a little bit more time with that person and give them some information. Or I have a bunch of stuff for you guys. Um, teach them a grounding exercise. Okay, how to bring themselves back to the present. Super easy, really, really easy to do. You can do it in like 30 seconds. So having them think of like categories, list off, you know, 10 movies you like, five different types of fruits, 10 of your favorite songs. So anything that brings them back to the present moment and grounds them if they're kind of dissociating or really anxious or really upset, gets their mind back to the present and pulls them out of that. Um, mindfulness, any mindfulness skills are awesome. Um, Scott and I are working on, and I haven't had a chance to do it, but we're working on putting together a list of apps for phones, free apps of mindfulness nice. exercise that you can download that are free that we want to be able to, ha be able to give to clients. Mm -hmm. There's going to be ones for kids, <coughs> ones for adults. Um, I have like. 50 of them that I've researched, all different types. So I'm still working on that. But there's a ton of really good apps that you can just say, hey, you know, you can put it on your phone. You can have them listen to a mindfulness breathing thing for 30 seconds or a minute if you're sitting in there with them. Um, I have a ton of really great resources I'm going to throw at you guys. Um, this is really cool. So any, if you have this and you want to make copies and just have it there in your office, so if you have an opportunity, even if you're just like, I'm really sorry, I'd like to talk to you about this. Let me give this to you for now to just look over. If I have a second, I'll come back later. Um, there's a de-escalation preference form. So what is helpful to you to feel better when you're having a hard time? It gives you a little checkoff list. 
Is there a person who's been helpful to you when you've been upset? So having them think of any resource that they might have, even if it's you know, somebody they talk to online. Oh, yeah, this one person I can talk to. Great. Um, what are some things that make it more difficult for you when you're already upset? Your triggers, being touched, being isolated, door open, people in uniform, loud noises, yelling. Um, have you ever been restrained? Um, is there anything? Asking those questions yeah. of somebody of trauma says a lot to them about listening Absolutely. and caring about their experiences. Is there anything that, that would make you feel safe? Give this, if you're busy, give this and hey, can you work on this for me? I want to talk to you about it when I come back in. What makes you feel safe? Um, so <clears throat> I have copies of that for you. This, I found this article when I was researching for the presentation today. This is fantastic. I was going to try and read some of it, but we ran out of time. It's called On Being Invisible in the Mental Health System. It's about a woman who had frequent interactions with the mental health system and how she felt the impact on her. Really, really good to read her story. Um, I have, and I can email, I can email electronic copies as well to Mike if you want so you can print them for yourselves too. Um, this is from um, a couple really great things. Seeking Safety, if anyone has seen the Seeking Safety manual that works on trauma and substance use. These are some handouts that are in the Seeking Safety book. Safe coping skills, 81 safe coping skills. Hey, can you go through and pick out your top 10? Have them circle them. Um, this is kind of a busy sheet. I can probably send you an easier one to go through, but um, detaching from emotional pain, guidelines for grounding exercises that you can use with a client. Super easy. Um, I'll pass those around. I'm all, this is also, um, I have the link to this at the end of my PowerPoint as well. And I will send this out. This is phenomenal. Um, the Power and Price of Survival. It's all about different ways to deal with people in crisis, trauma, um, mindfulness exercises. There's some great, another possible things that you can potentially use with um, folks that you work with. On, you know, um, oh, the other one that's also in here, the container exercise can be a really easy one to use with clients, even in five minutes or less. Container exercise. So take all of the difficult emotions you're feeling, what's happened to you, um, your dad beating you, your dad beating your mom, your mom using drugs, whatever it is. We're going to put those feelings and emotions and memories in a container. If you were going to have a container, what would you need to put in, what kind of container would need to be safe enough to contain, contain these things? How big would it have to be? Okay, it needs to be the size of a truck. It's going to be metal. So you're going to put the memories in there. It's going to be made of steel. Well, how are we going to secure the memories in there? We're going to put a lock on it. And we're going to throw it in the bottom of the ocean so nobody can get to it. So having them kind of do a mental exercise of taking all of these bad, horrible things and putting them in a container, like outside of themselves. And then if you're with your therapist and you want to work on them, you can take one of them out in a safe place. So that's another really good exercise. So I'll have you pass her. It's just, I alternated them. So it's just that. It's just the one with the, okay. so you can take the one with the thing on it. Um, so this information came from this book that I found online that's awesome that has a lot of good handouts that you could potentially use with clients as well um, or texts. If you have you know a couple minutes you can educate some of the texts on some of this stuff. And unfortunately we did not get to the most important part of all of this is the self-care because our work in crisis and dealing with folks in the mental health system is incredibly draining and burnout, compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma, all those other buzzwords that we hear, right? Um, 
resource that I have. Has everyone heard of the analogy or the, the metaphor? Um, there's also a kid's book, I think. Have you filled your bucket today? So the have you filled your bucket today is if you think of yourself on your best day, everything perfect, wonderful, everything is going along really well, and you're a bucket, your bucket is full of water, right? As we go throughout our day, people take from the bucket. So if you have kids, your kids require attention, so a little bit of water comes out. If you're married, maybe some water comes out for your spouse. Yeah, it's a full packet with the... They were all, they were all paper clips. They were full yeah. packet paper clips. Sorry. No, you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> They're good. They're just, it was a packet paper clip together, so that was just one. Um, so this is a really good exercise for you to do yourself that I would have loved to do if we had more time. But it's how full is your bucket. So it asks you about relationships and activities. What do you have in your life that keeps your bucket full? What adds to your bucket? So healthy relationships, people that I can talk to, my mom, my dad, my dog, whoever it is. Then what are the relationships or the activities that are a little bit of a give and take? Okay, so what are the ones that kind of deplete me a little bit but I also get something back from? And then what are the relationships and activities that make me feel empty and drain me? Maybe that's work some days. Maybe some days work is a little bit of both. So it's a great way to kind of check in with yourself about where you are and balance in your own life, which we don't always get to have. <laughs> and I had hoped to spend more time on that, but we had awesome discussion, which I appreciate. And I will send, for the need to move my car before I get plowed down out there, um, I will send all of this stuff to Mike so you guys have it. And you can use any of the materials and handouts for yourself, for clients, to share with the folks that you work with, the techs, um, whatever might be helpful. Do you have a microphone now? Yes. Oh. I do. <laughs>